First page. Jackson Clock. Next thing I did number six. Number six. I can happily explain number six. <laughs> no, shooters can come. Is it locked? I thought it was. Is it locked? One? What I would do on your piece of note paper that you're taking notes for today on, under problem number six, I would write down the formula that you were given for the lateral surface area of a pyramid. Jeremy Soares, what was that? It is the perimeter of base. I will. Move the shunted one to the third bag and then for it's every better on the even. I just you think it's short. They're back in that drawer right now. Shh. It comes December 4th. Is that um, the, the general gist of this is this. Kids, there's two ways that you can think about this. You could just find the area of each side, each triangle. You can't see it, but it gave you this line height. It gave what? Five? Five. Lateral surface area just means the area of all the sides except the base. So each triangle, since the bottom is all six, is six times five. A triangle is one half base times height. And base times height is 30 cut in half is 15. And then how many triangles are there? They're all the same because they're all the same base. There's four triangles that make this shape up, so that's 60. Otherwise, you could use this formula that said the perimeter of the base times the slant height all divided by 2, which is really the same thing we just did, just in a different order. The perimeter of the base would be 6, 6, 6, and 6, which is 24. The slant height was given to you, again, you can't see it, was 5. 24 times 5 all divided by 2. Uh, half of 24 is 12. 5 times 12 is still 60. So you can either use that formula or just look at lateral surface area is just the size, not the base. And again, it's area, so it's inches squared. Now, what um, So 5 would not be the height. 5 is the slant height. When you talk about this shape, the height is actually the perpendicular distance from the base. The actual height of this thing would go right down to the middle from the apex down there. That 5 was the slant height. It's the side, slanty side height. Still on page number one, please. Though, John, uh, still on page number seven. Wait, are we going to skip that one first? No, I think you can do that. It's not that hard. For the first four tor terms of the sequence, Term. The letter N stands for the number of the term. Okay. Ignore this because this doesn't have anything really to do with the problem. It is just a label. Okay. When you put one in for N here, it's A sub one, which just means the first term. Okay. You want the first four terms, so N is going to equal one, and then it's going to be two. The second term, the third term, and the fourth term. You just need to plug those in for the letter N right up here. So it's 2, for the first one, it's 2 times 1 minus 1. And 1 minus 1 is 0, so 2 times 0 is 0. The first term is 0. The second term, you put 2 in for N there. 2 minus 1 is 1. 2 times 1 is 2. That's the second term. The third term, you put 3 in for that n. 3 minus 1 is 2. 
and then two times two is four, and you can see the pattern now, zero, two, four, the next one's going to be, well, actually you have to do the next one because it's either going to be six or eight, probably. You probably have to actually do this next one just because. Four minus one is three, and three times two is six. So those are the first four terms. You don't worry about, subscripts are different than superscripts, which are exponents. Subscripts are just ways to label things. Show me a Number two. Yeah, number two is kind of a goofy one. Um, I don't know if when the book gave you this, if they really wanted you to do the problem or just know what we've been talking about, that when you make things bigger, what happens to their area? If you double a size shape, what happens to its area? It gets four times bigger because you're doubling two things, okay? If you don't do it like that, then you have to do this. They gave you two bits of information. They said the perimeter is 50 and the area is 150, okay? Now, with that, it's all kind of trial and error as to what shape that ends up being, okay? What shape... What shape can you make whose perimeter is 50 and its area is 150? I would start with the area first because area is easier to find. There's less numbers with area. What times what gives you 150? Well, you could try 75 and 2. If you use 75, 2, you know, that gives you 150 when you add it or when you multiply it. But when you add it, are you going to get just 50? No, because it's already 75 and 75 is already 150 plus whatever. So you, you know its dimensions aren't that. What other things will give you 150? 50 and 3. 50 times 3 is 150. But if you add 50 plus 50 plus 3 plus 3, do you end up with 50? No, so we're going to strike it out there. What other one? 15 and 10. 15 and 10. Is 15, 15, 10, and 10 added together give you 50? Yes, it is. So you know the one they're talking about, its dimensions have to be uh, 10 and 15. Now what happens to this thing? Well, its perimeter is not 50, it's actually 100. So what happens here? From 50 to 100 is doubling it, right? So when you double it, you end up with 20 times 30. Because that doubles each side. That gives you 600 for your area here as opposed to the 150 for your area there, which means it is four times bigger. Now you don't have to do that because of this one simple fact right here. If the perimeter went from 50 to 100, that meant it doubled. And when perimeter doubles, area, as long as, it's, as, long as it is a, a similar shape, if perimeter doubles, then area quadruples. Because it's whatever it is squared. And volume becomes 8 times bigger. It's not 6, it's 8. You're, you're using exponents here. Okay? If... If perimeter doubles, area is 2 to the second power, and volume is 2 to the third power. Okay. So if on tomorrow's test, if on tomorrow's test the perimeter tripled, then its area is going to be how many times bigger? Well, so far I have the answer. If the perimeter triples, then the area is going to be 3 squared times bigger. And the volume is going to be 3 cubed times bigger. Okay? If the perimeter was 6 times bigger, then the area is going to be 36 times bigger because it's 6 squared. You're, double, you're, square, you're, you're multiplying 2 times. Two, Two dimensions, okay? Oh, I wish I had it here. In other words, what you're doing in this, let's say my rectangle was a 1 by 3. If I make it 6 times bigger, the perimeter, that means this becomes 6 and this thing here becomes 18. Okay? You are making two dimensions 6 times bigger. So when you do area, 
it's actually six times six times bigger, 36 times bigger, because you're you're making two measurements that you multiply together six times bigger. It's a tough, tough, tough concept to catch. Emma Haynes? So is the answer how many 600 squared? No, the answer, it asked how many times bigger was the area. So what times 150 is 604? It's four times bigger. Wasn't that what it asked? Yeah. Oh, what would be the area of the garden? All right, 600. I guess you could have got that because you know it was four times bigger. <coughs> wow, sorry, I didn't even answer the question. My bad. Save. Who? Three? Three was a great one. I was hoping somebody would ask that now. I would say, here's what I would know for problem number three, because it's kind of, it's really hard to write any kind of a formula down for that. But you should know this, that the distance of something equals how fast you're going times the time it's going. I would write this in my notes, by the way. With that formula, you can also solve for time. If I know this, what does time equal? To get the letter T by itself, what do I have to do? Divide by, by, by I. I. So time equals distance divided by rate. You'd have to know that as well. And what other formula could we come up with there? You could use rate. Rate equals what? Distance divided by time. You can change that around anything. Now here's what I would do for this problem here. Bria walks quickly to school at 4 miles per hour. 4 m p h. Here's her house, here's school. Okay. It takes her 15 minutes. Okay. We need to know the distance there. So you look at your little distance formula. That's this one, right? This is the first formula you use. Distance equals rate times time. Well, the distance equals her rate is 4 miles per hour times the time. Now here's where there's an issue, though. In here, I'm talking about hours. Here, I'm talking about minutes. So you either have to change them both into minutes or both into hours, it's your call. And I would say, let's just change, well, so you're going to change this into, uh, what would it be? If you're changing hours into minutes, you have 4 miles per, per well, you have 4 miles per 60 minutes, right? And you're multiplying that by 15 minutes, correct? So when you end up doing that, you know, the 15 and the 60 cross cancel to give you 4, 4, and 4 is 1. You are going 1 mile. Okay? You did it that way. The other way you could have done, I, I would think it might almost be easier to change minutes into hours. One minute is one, or 15 minutes is one fourth of an hour, so four times one fourth still going to be one. Now, here is her distance. If she goes 10 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour is her rate. Her rate is distance equals this. Rate equals 10 miles per hour. And we want to know her time. So if you look at this, time equals the distance. How far did she go? One mile. What's her rate? 10 miles per hour. So how long, what's her time? Her time is one tenth of an hour. Now when we talk in real life, we don't talk about one tenth of an hour. You need to change that in minutes. You take an hour, divide it by 10. 60 minutes divided by 10 is six minutes. 60 divided by 10, you say 15. And again, it just gets a little complicated. That's kind of a, it's kind of a tougher problem just because it's smaller units than we're used to with, with the fractions. And we're cutting hours into minutes and minutes into hours. Lucas? Well, you could just like say, because four is the ten to and a half times, so then you can just multiply by 15 minutes times two and a half. The unfortunate thing is 15 times 2 and a half is 37 and a half. I don't know if that gets you. Oh, yeah. 
Dividing 15 by 2 and a half, yes. Then you'd get it there. Anybody catch what Lucas just said? No. Don't worry about it. Lucas, that's fine. If you want to go that way, you can go that way. Sage! Oh, where did you get the temp from again? It said right here. At 10 miles per hour, that's your speed. But that's her rate. I would love to be front of the Find the volume of the cone in question for express it in terms of pi. So you need to know the formula for volume of a cone, which is what? It's the volume of the cylinder, pi times radius times radius times height. That's the volume of the cylinder divided by 3. I can't see the cone, but I'm guessing it's somewhere down here on the other side of the page. Is it over here? Over. So its radius is 3, right? And its height is 4. Just roll that cone back here. Radius 3, height 4. So volume equals pi times 3 times 3 and its height is 4. And a quick way to do that is since you got a 3 on top and a 3 on the bottom, you can cross cancel this 3 with this 3. 3 times 4 is 12, so 12 pi would be your volume. Christ! Number 2, the perimeter was 6 and the area would be 2. For number 2, if the perimeter was 6, I don't know what that means. It's the ratio of your old perimeter to your new perimeter. Okay. If the old perimeter was 6 and the new perimeter was 12, what has happened to the perimeter? It has doubled. That would mean its area is doubled squared, which is 4. And its volume is double cubed, which is 8. Okay, see this ratio, it went from 50 to 100, and that's where we got, that's where you got doubled. Which means its area had to multiply by 4, and that's what 150 times 4 gives you that 600. Let me give you another one. What if if the original perimeter was 3 and the new perimeter was 12, what's happening to the perimeters? It is 4 times bigger. So its area is going to be 4 times bigger squared, which is 16 times bigger. And its volume is going to be 64 times bigger because it's 4 times cubed. Age. Is that on this page? Area, Sage? How do you find area? So it's just 2 times the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, right? What happens, Sage, when you have two identical square roots? And you get a, a normal number. Now you got this normal number, that normal number, 2 times 2 is 4. You just wanted me to. Is that every problem on the first page? Yeah. Um, Sean, can you explain to me number 15? We're not there yet, Jack. I asked about the first page, sir. <laughs> Anybody on number one? Do you have number one okay? Do you want number one? Uh, let's do number one. Okay. Then Jack will head off to number page number two. Yeah, same yeah, Alright, so here it is. Again, this is a percent, and really the easiest way for me has always been to draw this box. It's a discount problem. So it's the original minus the discount equals the final price. And the original is 100% always. What was my discount? 20% off. So my final percent is 100 minus 20, 80%.
Now, what is the sale price? They're asking me the sale price, and that is the final price. That's what they're asking for of a $495 television. Okay, we don't really need to know this. I mean, this is kind of immaterial because it's not part of the problem. We do need to know it to figure out the 80. So your proportion, your fraction, your ratio is 100 over 80 equals 495 over what number? So you just need to solve that. And the easiest way to do that would be to, Nick? I would use the fraction. Sure. Uh, you can cut off the zeros. Um, and then you can probably even reduce it down to what? Five over four. And then there's, I guess, no other easy way to do it from there other than know that you're going to take five times n, and that's going to equal four times 495. Can you just divide by five? Yes. You divide by five, you can divide by five right now. 5 goes before 95, what, 99 times? And then 4 times 99 is the same thing as 4 times 100 minus 4, 396. And that's your sale price. But hey, if you know it and it works for you, I'm all about that. I'm just trying to do it the most way I think most people would catch up. Lots of shortcuts there, but not everybody. I mean, if I did it, they'd go, I have no idea. Jackson, we are on to page two. Right? Can you do number nine? Well, Jack kind of asked about number 15. Didn't he? Let's do 15 just for fun. And then we'll get to yours. I'm not sure why it went okay so right away, but that's the way it goes here. Yeah, like All right, Jack, <coughs> what do I got to do here? I'm looking to solve for x. I don't really know how to do it. It's confusing for the fraction. Well, Jack, because fractions make you confused, let's change it to look like this just to figure out the process. What if I made this negative 3 plus 2x equals 12. What's the first thing you do there to solve? Sir? Uh, so, so now you get the letter x by itself. Subtract uh, all that from negative 3. Now why would you do that? Are you going to take 12 away from here and move it over here? Remember, I want to get this by itself. So I want to get rid of this, and I want to get rid of that. So the 12 is going to stay where it's at, because it's already on the side it needs to be on. First thing I'm going to do is get rid of this. How do I get rid of a negative 3? I add 3. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to add 3 fourths. I'm going to add 3 fourths. Common denominator is 12. So this is 9 twelfths plus 1 twelfth is 10 twelfths. So now I have... 2 thirds x equals 10 twelfths. I could reduce it. I'm just going to wait. And now it's simply, what do you do when there's a fraction in front of a letter, Lucas? And you flip and multiply. Three halves. Three halves. Well, cancel what you can. Doesn't matter. One, four, one, five, five over four. Two beyond fair answer. Now, who had the question? Jackson, number nine. Okay. I really don't like it quite this big. I feel like I'm on something quite a speed so I can get this a little smaller. Well, now I suppose I'm going to need this here. You will need a piece of graph paper or something to do this on there, on your homework paper, whatever paper it is. But first thing it says, Find two numbers. Their sum is 10, and their difference is 6. What's it mean if their sum is 10? X plus Y equals 10. They're two different numbers, so I can't use two X's, because so that would be two of the same numbers. Then it said their difference is 6. X minus 
y. When you subtract them, you get 6. You are supposed to take both of those equations and graph them. And again, this would be something you would do with the ruler. I being of exceptional talent, you'll just do it by hand and probably come close. Now the question is, Jackson, how am I going to graph those points? I'm going to run also into my problem. Well, usually we use slope-intercept form, but that's when it's solved for y, and y equals mx plus b. Okay, these aren't in that form. These are actually easier to solve, because these are what we call our standard form, in which case I use Nick. Would you like cover the y? Yeah, you use what's called the xy-intercepts. You find the place where each one crosses the axis, and it's pretty simple. In other words, this. If I cover up the x, what is y equal? 10. So on the y-axis at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you put a dot. That's my y-intercept. Cover up the y, x equals 10. That's where it crosses the x-axis. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now I've got my two points. I draw my line. That's the first line. Now I have to do the exact same thing for the other one. Let's pick a different color. Let's orange. Okay. Now here's the only place you have to be careful is when there's minus signs or negatives. The x is fine. x equals 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But y is actually, when you cover up the x, you actually get a negative y equals 6, which just means it's not positive 6, but negative 6 for your answer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. Put your dot there. Draw with a rule of your straight line. The place they want, the answer is where those two lines intersect. And if you look at that, it obviously comes out to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, comma, 2. Not a ruler. In other words, if you go back to this, Jackson, if x is 8 and y is 2, x plus 2, x 8 plus 2 is 10, that works. 8 minus 2 is 6. It's what solves both equations. It's a system of equations in which you need to show that sort of work. I wish I felt good. I have to be just know it's not because of you. Schwartz. Number 16. Anybody from 16, what's my modus operandum? Besides throwing my pen at Nick Shanks. The first thing I'm going to do is. Uh, get rid of the parentheses there. So it's just 5 times x, 5 times negative 2. 5 times x is 5x, 5 times negative 2 is a negative 10, and that equals x plus 6. Now again, following the rules of equations, you want all your x's on one side, all your numbers on the other side. So what's going to have to happen here, Jeremy? Okay, you're going to move my tens first. So I add 10. That gets rid of it here. I add 10. I end up with a 16 there. So now I'm left with this 5x equals x plus 16. And I have to now... Did you ask me this just so you could do the problem? Or did you not? Got it wrong? All right, what do I do with these x's? I want to get rid of this one, so I have to subtract it over. It goes away. Subtract 1x from 5x is you left with 4x equals 16. I just divide by 4 to solve from there. 16 divided by 4 is 4. Boston? Yeah. Uh, I hope so. By the way, you can watch, if you really want to, you can watch this all over again at justconfusing.com. You get HD, it's HD. Oh, it's, I call it LD. Low definition quality. Uh, all right, this one here. 
Same thing is true here, Austin. We want to solve this for x. So what do I have to get rid of first, sir? I want to get this x by itself. So you always get rid of the stuff that's not next to it first, which is this. How do I get rid of that 6? I subtract 6. I subtract 6 from both sides. I end up with a 75 over there. Now I have 3x squared equals 75. How do I solve for x at this point? Austin, you got a suggestion for me? What's that? Divide by my 3. When I divide by 3, I end up with 25 over there. So now x squared equals 25. And anytime you see it, something squared, to get the answer to what it is, you just take the square away and take the square root of the other side. And the square root of 25 technically is both a positive 5 and a negative 5. Because both of those, when you square them, will give you 5. Usually we take the positive as the accepted answer. Adjust the 5 with the okay. I'd probably give it to you, although since they asked for two numbers here, you can I don't think we have any reason for not putting both of them. Corinne. 18. 18. Where's my number 18? Thoughts for me on that one, Lucas Espanol? I like it. Make sure you have your thing of a jigger tomorrow. You can change it to one third times two thirds. Right. You gotta pick a standard form probably to make them all in. You're either gonna make them all decimals, fractions, or whatever. And in this case, fractions are your best bet because thirty-three and a third does not turn into a decimal very well, nor does two thirds. So you need to look at your thing. Thirty and three and a third percent is the fraction one third. And then you have the fraction two thirds, and then you have twenty-seven over one hundred. And lo and behold, look at how nice they are, because things cross cancel. Three goes into three ones and twenty-seven nine times. Three goes into three ones and the nine three times. Two goes into two ones and the one hundred. 50 times, and I think that's it. We run out of real estate. 3 over 50. Nick. <laughs> Number 20. Again, let me remind you on number 20, a fraction bar, a fraction line is a grouping symbol, which means this. You have to do this all down to one thing before you take it to negative of 20. That's what I was saying. Number 20, which isn't on my sheet. Yeah, that's great. How am I supposed to this fraction line, Nick, <laughs> is a grouping symbol, which means you've got to do this and simplify that, and then you can simplify the whole thing. So the first question is, what is 0.2 minus 0 0.02? What did you get, sir? I just crossed them off. I crossed wow. off the point 0.2. You can't do that because this is... You can only do that if it's all multiplication. Okay. You can only cross off when they're factors. You can't cross off when they're adding. You tried. You know, you want a case in point here. If I have this, six plus eight divided by three. Let me change that. Six plus eighteen divided by three. The answer to this should be six plus eight is twenty-four. The answer to this is eight. But if you said, well, I got a 3 on the bottom and a 6 on top, and I cross cancel this with this and get a 2, you actually end up with a 20. You can't do that. If it was 6 times 18, then you could cross that 3 off with anything. But it doesn't work that way with addition. So here you end up with 0.18 on top, all divided by um, 0.2 times 0.02. 
which is 0.004, right? Three decimals. And then you can just do the division. Um, again, just like with anything else here, I can multiply both the top and the bottom by the same number and end up with 180 on top over 4 on the bottom. It's going to give you the same answer if you want to do it that way. If you don't like working with the decimals, that's really what you do when you divide it out in this. Which ends up being what? 4 goes into 18, 4 times 16, 45. Yeah? Did you get that right? What? How many times does 4 go to 18? 4 times. Four times. Four times. <laughs> yep. Shall I have one? No, no, no. Let's look at this one here. Same thing is true. Kick a man with a down. Show hammer. So you got to do all this, put all this together first, and then you actually just change it to its opposite there. This one does not change because there's no other, it just is a negative 5. This one here, what's a negative 4 times a positive 3? Negative 12. Here's a negative, negative 2, which gives you a positive 2. You put all those together, negative 5, negative 12 is negative 17, plus 2 is a negative 15, over a negative 1, two negatives just end up making a positive 15. Have a Christ. Oh, what is, which is not proportional? And again, here's what you got to remember. Proportional, I haven't even read the problem, but proportional means what? It has to start at 0, 0 if you're graphing it. Okay, when one thing is 0, the other thing has to be 0. And it has to, there has to be a scale factor. There has to be some same thing that you multiply the first number by to get the second number. So, uh, a time worked and money earned at $12 per hour. So if you think about this, if you work zero hours, do you get paid zero dollars? Yes. And then one hour you're going to make twelve dollars, two hours you're going to make twenty-four dollars, your scale factor or your constant of whatever is times twelve. This is definitely proportional. Second one, the slide length and perimeter, or the side length and the perimeter of a square. Um, so if you do that, if you think about a square. First of all, all square sides are equal. If your side is zero, is your perimeter going to be zero? Yes. If your side, so zero equals zero. If your side is one, what's your perimeter? Four. So we know our scale factor for everything else has to be four for this to be proportional. If I do two, what's my perimeter? Eight. So you know that that's going to work. So this is definitely proportional. Time diving and distance traveled, time driving and distance traveled at 45 miles per hour. All right, so let's do that. If you go drive for zero hours, do you go zero distance? If you drive for one hour, do you go two hours, 90. So that's proportional because your scale back is times 45, so zero. The side length and area of a square. So here's my square again. Well, let's do it. If your side is all zero, your area would be zero. If your side is all one, your area is one. If your side is now, right there that tells you in order for this to be proportional, your factor would have to be one. Whatever this number is, that number has to be times one. If you put two in for these numbers, 2 times 2 is 4, and now that tells you because 2 times 1, you should have gotten 2 because you prefer it to be proportional. If you would actually graph that, it would look like this. 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9, 4, 16, 5, 25, as Jack says, it's a curve. Mr. Lucas said it was a curve? 
Actually, if I put it in upside down like this, it's like a font. <laughs> it is on the film. What part don't you quite get here? Oh, I did. I just it Oh, you did get it right. Oh. <laughs> Okay. It's really not that bad. It's not a little sour for you to use down this way. No, that's not that bad. Yeah. It's not you that bad. It's not 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 that bad. Yeah, I noticed. I was like, she's yeah. about to lie. She's 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 about to lie. What Jackson? Oh, yeah, okay, I no. <laughs> Anytime I say this, I mean, so do I. So do I. Again, you will be allowed to use your little chart of rational and irrational numbers here. The set of integers is a subset of what? And if you look on your little chart, you will see there's a smaller box that has integers in it, which is the positive and negative whole numbers. Okay. Integers is a subset. Integers is a subset of any box that is it is also in. In other words, this. Okay. Integers is this box, but integers also falls in the next bigger box, which is the rational numbers, and it also fits in the next number, which is the real numbers. Integers are a subset of rational and real numbers. So it's going to be rational because right. that's the next one up. Well, it doesn't matter. Real is an honor, so that's not my choice. Okay. So this is the only one that it actually has on there. Okay. Integers is a subset of the rational numbers. Rational numbers are a subset of the real numbers. It's a smaller part of it. Sage. Was this a problem you didn't even do? Yeah. Yet yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah, 17 again has issues for me because there's a couple different ways to do it. I don't know what's the best way to tell you. Who tells me what they did? Lucas Espanol. Uh, well, I moved the first x to the negative first power down to me. Okay, so Lucas is telling me this. The first thing he does is makes all the negative exponents positive. Is yes. that what you're going with? So, and the way you do that is just by moving it from top to bottom. So we still have a 6 on top, we still have a y squared on top, we still have an x cubed on top. He just moved the x to this x down here, so now we've got two x's on bottom like that. Okay, I don't know if that makes it clear. And then, Lucas? And then, uh, I took the y and cross it up with the y squared and then the top y was just a regular y. Okay, because y squared means you have two y's. One y on bottom will cross off with one y on top, so you're left with a y on top. Then, Lucas. Then I took the other two x's and crossed them off with the x to the third. Right, x to the third means you have three x's on top, you have two on bottom and three on top, so two of the three on top cross off with the two on the bottom, and you're left with uh, x on top, and then obviously two goes into six three times, so there's nothing left on the bottom, it's just that top. Okay, and it's just the taste in your mouth. That's yeah, because then you try to use your mouthwash and it's absolutely to to horrible. I tried. Eventually. Mouthwash doesn't have much try. You got some icebreakers. Uh, Nathaniel? Wait, did we do it already? Yes. No. How do you know? What part don't you get? You gotta give me a little direction. Well, after I was probably about that stuff, Well, tell me what you think. <laughs> Again, knowing that you get the letter X by itself. 
try to get the edge by itself. So what do you have to get rid of? What's on the same side? Give me some fractions that are on the same side as the equal sign with x that I want to get to the other side. And? Right. I'm going to get rid of both of those things. And you always, always wait. See, look at it this way. See how close these guys are? They're friends. So the last one to go is always your friends. So they, you don't want to deal with this until you got rid of this. So how do I get rid of a negative 3 fourths? Not multiply. Right, you always do what it's opposite. Opposite of subtraction is adding. Sure. So that's where my adding 3 fourths came from. Are you with me on this? Yes. So you end up with 10 twelfths now. Now, Nathaniel. <laughs> and then how do you get rid of the, the these guys are friends, how do I get rid of them now? What the multiple? Multiply them. Jack, Sony, and I can't imagine many more we could have. Well, again, number 17, you put a 3xy. Is it okay if you put the y? That's fine. Just in math, we do it numerically. Nice track. Oh, bro. You just said numerically. I should have done it. What's that? Well, thank you for that. I wish I felt like that. Nobody has questions on expanding using foil or graphing any number line. Really? Oh, I guess we have today. Spanish. So you might be able to miss Spanish, Mr. Todd. Oh, no, I'm not missing Spanish. I look forward to Spanish. <laughs> That was fun the last time. We have an hour and a half to go for it.